The next uh, session I involves uh, two um, speakers who, when I didn't know anything about Eritrea and I was a journalist trying to inform myself, um, I was very grateful for their publications, particularly Dan's, um, um, because there were so little published. And it, it, there it was, and you could, you could uh, inform yourself. And these are sort of amongst the classic writings on, on Eritrea. Um, so we're going to be talking about the rapprochement between Ethiopia and Eritrea um, in July 2018. Um, uh, a peace agreement was signed. Uh, Abiy Ahmed's um, presidency has changed an extraordinary amount of things in the region. Um, nobody really knows <laughs> where it's going to end or, or, or start. Um, uh, but um, let me just introduce, so our first speaker is Professor uh, Shetil uh, Tronvo, um, I probably mispronounced that, um, uh, who um, has been writing about um, the region, the Horn of Africa, <coughs> since the late 1980s, um, or writing about political development, conflict, human rights in Eritrea and Ethiopia, and he's a professor at the Bjorknes uh, University College in Oslo. So um, please um, come. And we're not going to film this session uh, because um, the speakers would prefer to speak more openly, so we won't be filming. Um. Michaela, and thanks to the organizers of the conference for pulling this together. And thanks to everybody here who has been struggling for so many years for Eritrea's uh, liberation and continue to do so. I would planned my presentation in two parts initially, starting with Eritrean refugee stories I've been collecting uh, over the last seven years, but there isn't time. So I'll just say a few words on that now, save the rest for my next book. There is a next book coming, I promise, <laughs> and move into the current context. If you want to read these stories, uh, there, many of them are up on my website, dancannell.net. Uh, you can find them there. And uh, if you scroll down through all those refugee stories in reverse chronological order, you'll get to the bottom where the, uh, there is one essay uh, titled Enough that I published in 2003. Since 2012, though, I've traveled to 19 countries to interview hundreds and hundreds of Eritrean refugees uh, in Europe, North, South, Central, uh, and South America, Africa, and the Middle East on why they left, how they got out, and what happened on their journeys. Most of you have heard such stories from friends and relatives. Many of you probably have such stories yourself. <clears throat> so I don't have to tell you just how traumatic this has been for people, for tens of thousands of people. But I bring it up now because I'm convinced that it's essential to heal the deep wounds that many people carry, what we call PTSD. Not only to lay the groundwork for a healthy society, but to build a vibrant, inclusive movement to achieve that goal. This trauma is a major obstacle to that. It cripples some people's ability or willingness uh, to act to achieve that goal. It twists others into poisonous anger, and it divides people from each other as effectively as religion, ethnicity, <coughs> or politics. I really urge you to take that up to help people surface it in order to get beyond it. Each story is different but they carry common threads. The majority, if we exclude children, have fled from some form of political or religious persecution or, or from the fear of it based on something they said or did and they're expecting to have reported. <clears throat> fear being the operative feature. Most I spoke with said they were convinced that nothing they could do would change things, which is both a reflection of the reality they faced so far and their own trauma. Surprisingly, many said they'd go back in a minute, but only if there was genuine, deep-going change. When I asked what that meant, they talked about getting more control over their lives and livelihoods, being able to help aging parents and afford to get married and have children, having a society of rules they could depend on, and not having to be afraid all the time. The concept of fear and uncertainty came up over and over again. As you know, little has changed in Eritrea since the declaration of peace last July. 
which is why the outflow of refugees not only continues but accelerates. In the first month after the border opened uh, last September, there were some 16,000 people who registered uh, with UNHCR and thousands more who didn't register who, but who went into Ethiopia to remain in Tigray or elsewhere. Many were women and children who hoped to join husbands already abroad at that time, though more than 3,000 were unmarried youths of national service age, which is more in that cohort than had ever come in up until that time. So it, that got lost sometimes with all the focus on the families. This continued right through December, and then it dropped off in January when the border, uh, were, were border points in Tigray were closed. Many <clears throat> continued to come, however, across illegal crossings, and by March, uh, the numbers <laughs> had gone up again. When I checked with ARA, the uh, Ethiopian Refugee Office, in March during my last trip there, I was told that there were 300 coming out each day. You can do the math. The highest numbers coming out up until this point were at the end of 2015 and 2016 when it was about 3,500. So now we're talking about seven to 9,000. This is not what people expected when they got peace. Nearly 10 months since the peace was declared, the outlook for the future is laced with uncertainty within both countries and in the region. A jumble of promising initiatives, dangerous trends, and unresolved crises. So many balls are in the air, so to speak, it's difficult to know where to begin to talk about the current context, but here's a stab at highlighting the main issues. First, the Eritrea-Ethiopia peace process. I'm going to get my watch up right side up so I can tell what time it is here. Um, though progress on peace, uh, on the peace agreement itself seems stalled in, in the public arena, it continues to build informally, uh, as Chettle said, among mid-level civilian and military officials and the people on both sides of the border. That has never been a problem. There are also bilateral teams that are said to be dealing with specific issues. <laughs> but there are obviously problems and pitfalls that could still derail it. There has been little institutionalization at the formal level, though some progress is uh, supposed to be coming soon on such issues as the border controls, customs, and port access, emphasis on the port. In my view, the fact that there has been no move to demarcate the border yet is not necessarily a bad thing as it leaves open the possibility of minor adjustments to reflect the reality on the ground once relations are normalized without derailing the process. I would expect, for example, small, small swaps of land uh, in the Arab and Sorona areas before this is over. But avoiding demarcation altogether would be extremely dangerous. Uncertainty itself is dangerous. A specific timeline for demarcation is needed whenever it's to take place. Otherwise, we're left with an ad hoc arrangement very like we had in the 1990s, and we all know how that ended up. Here's what I worry about now. Eritrea closed two of the four crossings to vehicular traffic in January, Rama and Zalambasa, both in central Tigray, as we just heard. There were several reasons for this, but one was to curb trade with Tigray and get control of currency exchanges over which Eritrea had lost almost total control. This highlights the problem of a closed economy and a more open economy uh, coming together and integrating. I, I don't see how this can work without uh, further changes on the <coughs> north side of the border. Second, there's been no follow-up to the impromptu meeting between Isaias and Deborah Sion in January that we all saw when they held hands together. Big change coming, nothing. Nor do, do, is there any prospect of a breakthrough in sight. And I don't think there will be until Abi makes it happen. Meanwhile, anti-Wayani rhetoric in Eritrean official media shows no sign of letting up. Uh, you can just go to testfoot.com. Uh, um, and last month, Isaias was reported to have told some of his top commanders to be on the alert for a possible TPLF incursion into Eritrea, as far-fetched to me as that sounds. There is a pattern here that's impossible to miss. Isaias is still fighting old battles while he pursues a broader agenda in and with Ethiopia. These trends do not bode well for a stable peace. 
One possibility is that he's setting up an excuse to claim national service cannot be scaled back before there, because there's still a national security risk. Now, two, the situation within Ethiopia. Despite some government claims to the contrary, inter-ethnic violence, often spontaneous, continues to erupt with devastating consequences at the same time that organized ethnic nationalists are growing in influence in many parts of Ethiopia, particularly in the Amhara and Oromo states. The federal government at first downplayed the conflict and only acted after, I'm sorry, I just jumped over one. The, one of the worst outbreaks in uh, inter-ethnic violence uh, in, in recent months took place in the Gadeo and Guji zones of southern Ethiopia, where up to a million people were displaced in 2018. In March, eight months after the crisis erupted, the UN reported there were still 620,000 IDPs and enormous difficulty in gaining access to them. The federal government at first downplayed that conflict and only acted uh, directly to uh, intervene after international and Ethiopian media gave extensive coverage to the crisis and the state of Tigray sent uh, 5 million Ethiopian burr for humanitarian assistance. Other areas experiencing inter-ethnic violence uh, recently include the Mayali region near Kenya, the Walega region of western uh, Oromia, the southern zone of Beni Shangal, the Harar region between Oromia and the Somali state, and the Kemont district of Amhara. Political clashes, as many of you are aware, also took place recently on the outskirts of Addis Ababa between Kiero militants from Oromia and militant Addis youth over a decision by the appointed Oromo mayor to give priority for leases on newly constructed apartments to Oromos from outside the city over residents who are already in the queue. That clash is interesting in many uh, ways because it put Abi in a squeeze between his Oromo roots and his all Ethiopia vision. Meanwhile, as you may also be aware, pan-Ethiopianist Burhanu Nega, we all know Burhanu, had to cancel a public forum in Bahadar when Amhara youth protested his insufficiently Amhara nationalist platform. Both incidents highlight the rising force of ethnic nationalism. In the Amhara state, this is manifested in violent conflict around Kemat and claims on two districts in, of Tigray, Wolkite and Rayakobo, with the threat from some nationalists to go to war with Tigray. To summarize, unrest continues in many parts of Ethiopia, while ultra-nationalist forces continue to gain strength ahead of the 2020 elections, if they're not postponed. Isaias' actions in this regard have not been designed to promote stability, especially when it comes to Tigray, but also in his relationships with other parts of Ethiopia. And Abi has not been putting enough time or attention into dealing with this, which takes me to regional issues. Throughout this year, Abi's main preoccupation has been promoting peace and regional integration, focusing mainly lately on a three-way alliance among Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somalia. In March, uh, for example, President Kenyatta of Kenya came to Addis to meet Abi, who took him straight to Asmara for talks with Isaias on regional peace and stability. The next day, Abi took Isaias to Juba for talks with South Sudan on peace and regional security. Two days later, Abi hosted Somali President Formaggio and whisked him off to Nairobi for talks on Kenya-Somali border issues. A week after that, he hosted the Somali uh, land leader, but he was unable to get him and Formaggio to sit down together. Throughout this diplomatic blitz, Isaias went along with the bilateral context, but refused to engage with EGOT or the AU, both of which he begrudges for past acts against Eritrea, but more importantly, I think, he sees them as institutions too big and too diverse to dominate until he has solidified a sub-regional base. In pursuit of this, he has worked with Abi to include the extremely weak Federal Republic of Somalia in partnership while icing out Djibouti and Sudan. Sudan is hardly at this point a strong state, but that's a different issue. Credible sources in Addis say teams have been established to take the first steps toward linking the economies of Eritrea, Ethiopia, and the Somali Republic. Uh, in this regard, Abi wants to move quickly, Isaias more slowly. So what's this about? I want to just reflect for a few minutes uh, on where I think this is headed. 
Some of you interpret this as a new version of Ethiopian expansionism in which Isaiah is Avi's patsy and basically giving him Eritrea. I take the opposite view. Regional integration is a key objective for Abi, but the way it's unfolding reflects the long-term strategic interests of Isaiah. Each is using the other. The question really is who's the puppet and who's the puppeteer? Or are both playing each other? Constructing a core alliance that can be easily dominated and used as a platform to operate within larger arenas and organizations would be consistent with Isaiah' historic method of operation, which has always re uh, relied on force multiplication through nested organizations, like Russian matryoshka dolls, as I've written elsewhere. Think about it. Building a sub-regional alliance on a shake, as shaky a foundation as these three countries provide is either the height of hubris or a crafty strategy for establishing a core alliance from which to engage with stronger states and other regional bodies. My guess, based on all I know of Isaiah, is that it's the latter, a well thought out strategy. I also think Abi is aware of Isaiah's intent, but is okay with it as long as it meshes with his own vision mm -hmm. of an integrated region whose member states eschew conflict, hence the each one playing each other. Think of Abi in this, uh, this contest as a good checkers player, and think of Isaiah as a master of Go. If you know the game of Go, it's a Chinese game that Isaiah learned in the 60s. It involves uh, uh, two players, each with different color stones, one trying to surround the other, and when you enclose somebody, you take their pieces off the board. The challenge is to see abstractly the fact that as you're uh, manipulating uh, uh, a, a tactic to, strata, uh, to surround somebody in one place, you're actually being surrounded at the same time. I urge you to check the game out. It's a good one. <laughs> Abi's hope is that economic integration will blunt uh, inclinations toward conflict between states by giving each one a stake and maintaining the peace. This is fundamentals to, of conflict resolution. The big question is whether it will also dampen conflict within these states and whether it can survive as a project if it doesn't. Other such undertakings in Africa, based or the Middle East or Europe for that matter, based upon uh, shaky foundations like this do not provide a basis for optimism. If you're old enough to recall it, and almost everybody here is, think of the ill-fated UAR, the United Arab Republic. Several scenarios appear possible. Uh, sorry, skipping something again too. While this is playing out, Ethiopia is in the midst of its own transition from an authoritarian one-party state dominated by a single ethnic group, which has been for over a century, I would point out, into a more open democratic one, a state in which regional power has also shifted dramatically even as conflict within and between regions has intensified. So that's the context we're dealing with. Several scenarios appear possible. One. The continuing degradation of the EPRDF as a working coalition could end with its reconfiguration into a slimmed down party based on individual membership that replaces the one region, one vote structure it has today. This may be desirable in the long term, but it could have uh, destabilizing impact if implemented too hastily. Under such conditions, the TPLF might either be excluded or could exclude itself and seek alliances with other regional parties like the AFARs or with parties completely outside EPRDF. There are indications it's exploring this option. And why not? What remains of ADP and ODP, the Amhara Democratic Party and the Oromo Democratic Party, in the face of their internal challenges, might then either constitute the basis of a slimmed down pan-Ethiopia EPRDF allied with elements from smaller states and pan-Ethiopian uh, parties. Two, another scenario. EPRDF could also give way to a new formation altogether that engages in a free-for-all, after which the winners negotiate a new European-style coalition. Three, worst case, Ethiopia could fragment into competing mini-states, a number of which would face continuing internal conflicts as, uh, among, as well as conflicts among themselves. A fourth alternative would be for EPRDF to regain its balance in present form, bring TPLF back into the fold for now, 
and get through the 2020 elections before restructuring the political arena and with it the Constitution. That seems to go against Abi's temperament, but it is not uh, out of the question if all, the only other option is chaos. <laughs> Bringing TPLF back into a stable of short-term relation with Abi and EPRDF would provide a basis for bringing Eritrea into a dialogue with the Tigray state under the auspices of the federal government. It would also strengthen the federal government's capacity to address internal security issues and to pursue and consolidate other regional initiatives. I'm on my last page. <laughs> By engaging Tigray, uh, sorry, by engaging Tigray in the efforts, especially those involving domestic conflicts. This is what I think would be the wisest for the short term and the best for Eritrea. And then there is Eritrea, which has so far shown no sign of reform. This in itself is not surprising. The regime has never been quick to act and it is clear they had not been prepared for this. They have no master plan, and they don't have the capacity to do it all. Not the diplomats, not the negotiators, not the skilled managers, not even the skilled workers to carry out whatever plans they do come up with. What, whatever they come up with, much of it will have to be in, in, involving foreign assistance. They also need to move to make some reductions in the national service and loosen the tight controls over the economy to attract foreign investment and stimulate trade and they're a precondition for curbing the flood of refugees leaving the country. We'll see if the opportunity presented by donors and investors is enough to jolt them into such action, but I'm not optimistic. On the other hand, I want to end on a more positive note. Here are a few things I see that give me a glimmer of hope for the future. One. Plans to expand and improve the main roads and port facilities do set the stage for a major change in the continuation of national service as now practiced by offering a unique opportunity for transitioning to a wage-based la wage labor force. This is a one-time opportunity. If not taken, it will not come around again. I just hope the people inside Eritrea also see that. But will donors put up with national service labor on big uh, infrastructure projects? Will foreign investors even come in as long as they face the prospect of reputational damage for this? And what impact will the still unfolding uprising in Sudan have on the Eritrean population and the military? It's too early to tell, but Eritrea is now bounded on two sides by countries in the midst of major transition away from authoritarianism. All this adds pressure for change. Meanwhile, more refugees are staying in Ethiopia due to the risks of onward migra migration and, interestingly, <clears throat> to the hope for change at home. And new refugee-driven initiatives are surfacing. On my last trip, I met members of a university, an association of university students who are tutoring other refugees for entry exams to Ethiopian institutions and provide services to the community. This work by design prepares Eritreans to return home to help rebuild when circumstances and opportunity align. They at least are pointed in the right direction. One, one place I want to end, though, is uh, with the issue of why have, has there been no public protest in this? The main protest is seen at the borders with people leaving. The culture of obedience that Paulos mentioned in the beginning is certainly one piece of that. Uh, the the, the lever, level of fear is clearly another one, and it's the one most people give to it. Uh, I would add that there's a third, and that's the absence of hope and a viable <coughs> alternative. After what people have been through, nobody wants to just see chaos at the other end. So what you're talking about here at this conference is one of the, I think, the most important piece of this. But go back for a second to number two, the fear, and think of what we immediately thought, all of us, when the alarm went off. We're convinced of the power <laughs> of that government and that party. And, and, and they have won a huge victory <laughs> by doing that. And, and the thing is that one of the things you see is, as, as Shettle said, they've closed the borders, but there are still people pouring out. 
Now, I would like to see more people staying in for all the reasons that I've just gone into, but they're not being shot at or harassed or even arrested by border guards because we've passed a point where Eritreans want to do that to other Eritreans. That's a really important step. I don't think Isaiah still has the control that he thinks he does mm -hmm. over his own uh, army and security forces. So we're in a new era. I leave it to you guys to tell us where we're going. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, Hapsi, can you just tell me what...